welcome to this month's edition of LTC Coffee Break. This is our full shot. So none of this espresso stuff, it's the full shot. Pinch hitting today for Michael is my internal Justin Fox and our ace case manager, Ben Schwipp. Thanks for joining us. We got a lot going on. We're gonna get right into the conversation. Well, Ben, let's start off by talking about uh, where do you find the most common issue or one of those most common issues that have popped up uh, regarding uh, business you know, over the last six or eight months? It's always good to know if your licensing is, is in good order with the trainings or NAICs or whatever the case may be. Um, when that business slows down, that's that's the first flat tire. I see you know, a lot of cases that come through, and that does have a ripple effect. Everything from seeing from the agent knowing what's going on, trickling down to us, uh, affects other departments and teams. And that's one thing that I constantly do see a lot of. Um, but you know, once licensing gets through it, and the agent's office or the agent themselves is aware to look on the site for any updates at real time type of thing, that's one thing that could be you know, speed things up. But of course, the more they write we don't have those problems because, you know, once they've got business in house and whatever, and the appointment's complete, we're good to go generally. So, so do you think um, that's isolated just to uh, new producers or is there, you know, even a trickle over where someone that hasn't done something with us for a while or hasn't written long-term care in a while where their certs may not be up, up to speed? Is that, is that, that an issue? Happen. It does happen, it's not quite as common. It's more common with the new producers. However, okay. we do have some situations where an agent wrote a case uh, in a non-resident state a year ago. Well, then they submitted another case and it turns out licensing, oh, hey, your license is expired. Agent was aware of it because obviously it's a non-resident state. They may have let that one go off the radar. So that would then, of course, you know, slow down having them go out to meet with clients to get new signatures, things like that. A lot of times we can get, you know, some things at delivery. Some things we can't, so it's good to know. Make, again, it all boils back to the licensing to make sure you have that piece firmly in place before submitting business. So, would the um, BGA agent advisor producer would they go to you, Justin? Or would they? Where would they circle around to make sure the requirements are um, are in good order? I guess would be the right word. Uh, a lot of times on that. Uh, I'll say at least initially they come to me because um, I do have access to see some of it when it comes to like if they're asking like their license itself they have to go to the licensing department because I can't accurately say hey we have an up-to-date copy of your license on file or something like that okay. some of the system will allow me to see you know some information um, uh, so like if they're like oh did I complete product training I can look that up for them. how about you Ben is that any different like Justin said, I can check and see if you've done product training. I can check and see if you have an NAIC, like annuity training certificate, those types of things. I can see, I can't see anything as far as how the appointment is going, if they've had LTC certification or yep. Yep. that. That's I, I always punt that ball back to the experts in licensing. That's what the customer service team is there for, and they can accurately answer it. Whereas if I give a wrong answer, then I'm doing nothing but impeding the process of moving this thing forward. So. Right. Well, what, what other uh, roadblocks early on do you come across? From what I see, as far as uh, when, even if a piece of business comes in squeaky clean, depending on the, the, the current situation as the queues go, right now, as everybody's aware with the Washington situation, that has caused a, a large load to come onto everything from app entry to underwriting to even the vendors in the field. Uh, LTCG, we're seeing delays in getting interviews scheduled and things like that. Um, my suggestion on this, as far as the current situation, as far as that goes, I would recommend, and I have been recommending folks and agents to complete part two of the application with the client, because that way that, you know, it, it may be a maybe an uncomfortable and easy conversation for the agent to have with the client, but basically by the client completing part two with that agent, it's kind of going around the LTCG process, which right now I'm seeing them scheduling out. It's about early to mid-October, right, or I'm sorry, September rather, my bad. Um, so we're seeing a couple of weeks delayed in just getting the interviews done. And by the time those are done, they go into under and queue and then they're in line for review again. Whereas if a part two comes in, it basically goes right into the under and queue. 
and they're able to view it a little faster. If requirements are needed, say exams or an APS record, gives us a head start in ordering that. Um, that can shave off, you know, a week to two weeks or worse or more in some cases, as far as waiting to get this thing maybe pushed through for a deadline or uh, or whatever that might be coming up. That, that helps it move forward quicker as far as that goes. Some agents don't like to do part two, and I understand that. Um, some of those things can be a little bit more complex, but if you have a case where a client is in good health, um, probably would be a little bit quicker process to go ahead and do that part two. Um, and it, 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 you know, a lot of times the vendor I need something, they'll reach out for it. I've seen some cases that part two will give them enough information to move forward with the decision quicker. And that's always a good thing versus having to wait for an interview to be completed and submit. So, okay. so even with a part two, um, we we don't slow the process up once it comes in house e either clean or even if we have a table rated scenario potential because right. we're going to need to go down that road anyway right. and we have more information that at hand earlier so it does it does save waiting two three weeks if we um, take the bull by the horns and drag it down and say here's all the information that you got and right. then if we need an APS or a pyramid out of it we'll order it so the uh, uh our our agent or bga won't have to order it for us there are some firms that do order their own exams however one america will always order all the aps records so if underwriting has them on the sheet as far as a, a firm that does the uh that does the ordering of the exams they'll post it online for the agent or the back office to see and so that way they are they have the heads up and reach quicker um that being also said, they'll go ahead and uh, by taking LTCG out of the out of the picture, it really truly really does make it go a little quicker right now. Um, because, like I said, with the delays that we're seeing with the volume that, that they're getting, you know, it just if we're taking a third party vendor out of the out of the loop for just this initial part, we may be waiting on an APS. Gosh, for a month, I'd hate to add on another week or two because we're waiting for an interview to be completed when we can have the part two submitted and then the review before. That see right that right there I think is great advice, you know, cutting the corner and, and getting right to the to the especially if we have something that we know is going to be tricky, we get right, right to the right into the process. And you know, and the same thing being said there, like you said, you know, if it's so clean that we can underwrite it right off the app, we we don't even have to go down that road. Just having the, the agent and the client provide as much information as they can up front for underwriting can a lot of times save us from having to order exams and be at the mercy of an APS or something like that. Because once we place those orders with those vendors, we're truly at the mercy of their scheduling. They may have examiners that are booked out three weeks out. They may have a medical records department that only has three people working it and they have high volumes. Um, we That's one thing that you know myself and any of the other case managers, we have no control over. Underwriting doesn't have control over it. We're at the mercy of another vendor, and anytime we can have control of that wheel and and, and you know and, and kind of get together and how quickly the thing moves forward, that's a good thing. I know on, on my end of it, that's why I think it's so important to push the pre underwriting form. That's Absolutely. where I think that you take advantage of that. That kind of helps set the expectations. So kind of going back to what you you guys have said is if you if you pre screen them, which is a quick process and it's easy. I mean, generally speaking, in an hour or less, you have a response on those things. So if you, you you may get a response saying, depending upon the levels of such and such, you know, we may be able to consider them for this, that, or the other. Well, once they give you that information, if they're saying they're going to need, you know, certain levels to be tested, you can go ahead and uh, relay that information over to the client. Maybe they have to schedule, you know, a doctor's appointment to go ahead and get those, you know, get their blood glucose level, whatever it may be, tested. And then they already have that as well as going ahead and submitting that with your part two, you can maybe speed up that process because like like you said, like right now, a lot of it's just out of our hands. You know, once we get to a certain part, we're at the mercy of vendors at that point to really get things pushed through. So anything we can do to speed up the process on this end, I think it's just very important for us to do it because I think as an agent, uh, the last thing you want to do is have a client back out, not because they don't want the product, but because it's taking too long. You know, that the one pager, um, you know, for ineligible for, for annuity care, inel ineligible for asset care. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, being consumer approved, 
that's great. It's nothing more than, okay, take a look at this. Are any of these maladies something in your life? The, if the answer is no, that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. But if the answer is um, yes, well, we know we can't do anything there. Yeah. My rule of thumb has always been, hey, if it's not on the list, that's a maybe. And if you're yeah. concerned about it, let's do the do free underwriting and get the informal and, and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. And then that way, because too, I know I've heard I've heard agents say, hey, my client wants to know up front, you know, do they have a really have a chance of getting the product? Well, you can you can pre-screen them and find out. Do they have right. a chance? Is, is it a guarantee? No, but it's going to give them a very good idea of how we're going to look at them. So if there is not a chance for them to do it, you know what? As an agent, it's going to make you look good because they're going to say, well, at least I didn't go through this whole process for something that I wasn't going to be eligible to get anyway. So, right. you know, it's going to make the agent look good anyway, you know, by doing it. So. And, you know, and that, there you could also just pivot down and say, hey, we can't do we can't do asset care, but we can do annuity care. And, you know, I go back to the, you know, my Rolling Stones quote, you can't always get what you want, but you can get what you need. What you want may be asset care, but what you really need is long term care solution. Mm -hmm. well, we we hit the nail on the head right there. And, uh, you know, and I, I mean, that that actually is great plagiarism of a great song. <laughs> but that's just me. I want to. <laughs> A lot of times when we get the uh, application in-house, if they've done that, that's another thing too to keep in mind. If you have done that, and if it's a good one for your client, and you have the answer, attach that to the application or note down the cover sheet and put that with the application paperwork. Because a lot of times it will go ahead and we'll get an application in-house. It goes through underwriting and underwriting will come back with something, you know, whether they need something or additional information. Agent will be like, hey, I, I already covered this with, the underwriter on the pre-underwriting screen sheet. Well, I look through the case and if I don't see it, we don't know it's ever been there before. And underwriting doesn't either because there's a full staff of underwriters and there may be a few of them that answer those pre-underwriting interview, the uh, pre-screens. And so that way they can coordinate with the, that person who answered that and say, hey, what did you see here? And, and they can then have that conversation. Um, but if we don't know that we already have a tentative decision or what they saw beforehand, we don't want to ask this client for the same information twice because that makes us look like the left hand and the right hand don't know what they're doing. But also, it just, again, goes back to speeding things up a little bit. While you went through the process, give us that information you got. That, you know, it's just simply, it's a, it's just a one or two page thing to add on to it or a note on the cover sheet that, you know, for a conversation with underwriter Steve, you know, in on this date, tentatively scheduled for, you know, preferred or whatever, yeah, you know, type of thing. Just let us know that, that that conversation already has happened. It's save a step. What if, um, from a, a operations perspective, policy ends up being issued not as applied for? So we have a table rating. We go from applied for as preferred, and now we're table 6-6 six, six for the sake of argument. What does that do to you, Ben, uh, in terms of, of process? Does it bring everything to a halt until we get illustrations and signatures or or what happens? If we do have a lot of times an adverse underwriting decision, underwriting is really good about letting the case manager on that on that particular application know, hey, John came back, created table 66, but the wife's preferred. That's when we create those alternative options that we reach out to sales for, basically providing the copy of the illustration that we originally received, which is always helpful. That's one suggestion I can always give any agent or any back office, please submit a completed or an illustration of how the product's being applied for with the new business paperwork. It helps processing enter the application right to know that we're going to issue it as the client purchased it or wanted to purchase it. But also in a situation like this where we have an adverse decision, if I'm reaching out to Justin saying, hey, you know, client applied for the product, here's a copy of the original illustration, it makes his job so much easier but versus me having to go through the application and say, okay, this is what the face was going to be. This was what the, 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 the writers they wanted. The illustration is a roadmap that he can follow and get this done a lot quicker and easier on his end too. But um, as far as like, you know, a, a, a table rating or something like that, really as long as we had that good communication with the back office or the agent and the sales team, as long as us are working hand in hand, we can usually get that revised illustration in pretty quick as long as the agent, you know, has that conversation with the client, lets them know, hey, this is how it came back. Do you want to go? Do we get a red light or a green light? And then we can kind of move forward that way. But 
as far as that goes, the new the signatures and stuff generally were okay, unless it's a going from a joint to a single and we were missing the, the approved spouse's signature and we only had it on the declined person. Those are situations, depending on the form, we may need to collect prior to issue. If not, we can usually make an, uh, an issue, um, a, a delivery requirement to get that at delivery. But, you know, again, depends on the form, depends on the situation. Justin, what do you see on your side for those scenarios? A lot of what I see on that end uh, for me is um, missing forms or uh, sometimes I would say when um, uh, you have a joint situation um, and uh, let's just say uh, like like what Ben said with the alternative option, I try my best to make sure that I get you what you apply for. So, you know, based upon if you applied on a monthly benefit or a premium amount. I try to make sure I show you the same premium amount, the same monthly benefit, so you can see what that would cost as well. And then if there's something else that maybe comes into play, show you that. And what I mean by that is kind of what you mentioned earlier, where you wanted asset care, but you needed LTC. So I'm going to show you an annuity route because it may make more sense now that, you know, Mr. got rated. Um, and a lot of times just try to reposition it and understand that the annuity route is not a bad route. By any stretch of the imagination, I know sometimes people get wrapped up on, you know, oh, we don't want an annuity. Our annuity solutions can provide a very solid uh, benefit, and even in rated cases at times, equal to or greater in terms of benefit because there's no rating on our annuity products. So, um, you know, when it comes to the alternative options, um, you know, it having a quote. It's huge because it allows us to make sure we're accurately giving you back something that you applied for. Getting to the, um, to the you, you mentioned the paid part, which I think is the important one. What is the big roadblock or the biggest roadblock? I, I Ben, let me let me say something real quick on that uh, because <laughs> here recently I've been trying to have a little bit more communication with new business, trying to see some of the things on, on cases that we see to help out, you know, agents and even the back offices, uh, you know, just to provide additional information when I can. And one thing I've noticed for me, there are a lot of agents who have everything in. They just have to go collect the, uh, the premium and get the delivery receipt back. Mm -hmm. So I look at that. I'm like, you did all this work. And then now you're starting to come down to a deadline where it's like the underwriting decision is going to expire. So you right. did all this work and then you let the underwriting decision expire, then you're kind of back at square one. And that's sure. not that's not going to be a good position to be in. So for me, a lot of the ones I've been running across are where agents have, they've done all the work, um, but they, you know, they're still missing the delivery requirement in the premium and haven't returned it. In regards to what, you know, can help the agent get paid quicker, aside from that, on like Justin said, on cases where we send them out COD, um, you know, now we're requiring besides the premium, and we have a COI form that we require. That's new due to a lot of the COVID situations. And on COD cases, it's always been a requirement to make sure that there's no been change, no change in the client's health or eligibility since the original decision was given. Um, so that being said, those are simple things that you know we'll take a we'll take a DocuSign or e-signature on that form. It doesn't have to be original. So if a, you know if a client's traveling or whatever, and they can coordinate with the client, the agent, the client can. Get that back to me in PDF in our e-check form. That's huge. You don't have to even see the client to collect their banking information, right? Have the premium on that form. Get that to us. We'll take premium via wire, ACH. They can use a credit card for the initial down. There's options to get that funds to us. All of it can be done with an email that you can upload on our site or to me or, you know, that type of thing. We can make this, you know, as quick as possible getting it paid. Because nothing like getting down the finish line and basically have something underwriting decision expire or you miss a, a saving age opportunity or something, some kind of a deadline because, you know, you couldn't get that last requirement in. So, and a lot of times it's the premium. We see it all the time on premium. We covered a ton of stuff. Is there anything else that you see as a roadblock um, that we can, we can do um, collectively from outside of um, – outside of the tower uh, to, you know, to make things work more efficiently, be it the producer, EGA, or even Justin and me. Definitely, I can tell you, keep promoting the e-app that we have out there now. That process is fantastic. 
it comes in a lot of times an application will come in with very few if any missing requirements um you know obviously it'll, it'll, it, it it will all the major things that the system will let you you know submit it until they're taken care of so that basically takes a lot of error out of it so if it's something that was a, a missed thing or something additional requirement it keeps that list very short for us comes in through quickly a policy number is going to be assigned to it so we're not having to do a search by a client last name hey ben do you see an application i submitted for jane smith i see about 150 jane smith do you have a social then we have to dig deeper into it you know as far as that goes whereas i can usually find it by a policy number kick it out to them let them know right where we're at it's a little bit quicker process a little bit smoother and less headaches for the back office too but um that's that's something i would definitely promote as well as like i said just you know in this time of where our business volumes are higher, especially as we steamroll toward the end of the year, anything to get it through from when it comes in our doors to get back out the door to the you know, as an issue policy, definitely you know, make sure licensing is in good order. If you can do a part two with a client, I promote that idea because that goes through underwriting or hits the underwriting desk a little quicker than waiting for an interview to be completed and returned to us. And then like I said, e-app comes through a lot cleaner and can be processed just as quick. That would be my suggestion. And collect premium any chance you can. Get that initial premium. Hold that, you know, hold that, hold that saving age situation, or at least that way, when it's a green light to issue, it gets issued. So it just it's a lot quicker process by doing it that way. Well, I don't want Ben to have all the fun and answer the questions. Justin, what do you have? One thing I think it's very important to understand. Um, you know, when we talk about that EF, it's like it's it's honestly not very difficult. So it's one of those things, once you, you get in there, you realize that, and the beauty is it, it and the agent gets paid faster. <laughs> it reduces the sales cycle. Um, in a lot of cases, it creates a better client experience, and then it reduces the number of trips you have to make to the client. So right. it's just overall can be a very, uh, a much more efficient way of, of getting the application in. And then to, on top of that, the thing is, whether an agent is appointed or not, we have an, a way for them to do the e-app. So the, so the entry points for uh, our e-app process are the calculator, mm -hmm. uh, our uh, OLS, online services portal, mm -hmm. and you can also get it from iPipeline. Right. And they all yep. sit on the same technology at all, regardless of interface, it looks and moves and behaves exactly the same. And I actually, I, I want to say one thing, and Ben, you tell me if you, uh, if you, you feel differently uh, when it comes to that. But a lot of times they come across a question like, "Well, a client doesn't doesn't know what they want," kind of thing. Here's the thing: if you if they know they want a policy, take the highest amount. Just because you submit a quote doesn't mean that's what they have to end up issuing you. Right. Take the highest one. If you're like, ah, they're, they, they, they're looked at 200,000, but may only want to do 100, that's fine. Submit the 200,000. That way, they're going to get underwritten based upon that amount. And if they decide to reduce the amount, chances are you won't have to do any more additional underwriting. But right. if you go the opposite route and you try to put in more, you may have additional underwriting that you have to go through, in which case, again, adding more time to the process. That's good advice right there, Justin. It's easier to go high and come in low than go the other way around, yep. for sure. You know, we, we talked about a lot of stuff, um, and it all really comes down to process uh, and doing a couple of little things that will help big time on the back end, taking advantage of technology, um, you know, and, and, and really uh, communicating on the get -go, from the get-go using the free underwriting inquiry. Uh, they all can have a huge impact on where we're trying to get. And what we're trying to do is get as much business in the pipeline, through the pipeline, and in force as we can. Your win is our win, and we measure ourselves only on what we all do together. And I appreciate you taking time to uh, work with me uh, and, you know, and, and co-host uh, while Michael is out. Uh, thanks again for jumping in. It's uh, Justin, Ben, myself saying thanks. Remember, remember every Tuesday, 10 a.m., a new uh, episode of LTC Coffee Break uh, webcast drops. Every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., we have virtual consumer seminar. Or 
both of those go to ltccoffeebreak.com and you'll be able to see the most current edition of what we have going on as well as an archive of everything that's going on but remember my quote from earlier i'm going to steal from the rolling stones once again you can't always get what you want but you get what you need that's for you michael thanks guys i appreciate it and uh hope everyone has a great day